Good morning. Ken Leon Guerrero again. Uh, had a broadband issue that uh, knocked us off uh, when I tried starting a few minutes ago. But let's try again. Today's show is titled The Lesser of Two Evils, Part 3. The way I've selected that title is that uh, our, politi our political parties have failed us. Political parties, once upon a time, were a good idea, but they came to become less than a vehicle for the people to organize, to uh, run for office and serve the people, than it became for uh, competing business camps. On one hand, lesser of two evils, we have the... Uh, Republican team of Camacho Atta, and we have the Democrat team of Leon Caro Tenorio. So at the 30,000 foot view, what we're looking at is two very, very weak teams. When I say weak, weak in the public service credential area. See, public service is a calling. It's not a money-making opportunity. But the way the political parties and the political party leaders, which are basically uh, divided around different business groups, look at government of Guam as an ATM machine to dispense high paying jobs and contracts to their supporters. And as we saw during the Calvo administration, a huge opportunity to transfer public assets into private hands for the benefit of politically well-connected insiders. So let's look at the state of our island today. What we're looking at here is a, uh, hold on, let's try this. Yeah, there we go. What we're looking at here is an economy that's been crippled for the past two years. But prior to uh, the pandemic, our economy was in a decline. Even though tourist arrivals were up, the amount of money they were spending was going down. And at the last special economic session I uh, attended, 80% uh, of the government revenue funds were not, were not hitting their forecast targets, making their ability to balance out at the end of the year of that nearly billion dollar budget in jeopardy. So we were in 2019, I would say we were heading towards a 50 to $60 million deficit. And then the pandemic hit. Good thing for the Leon Guerrero administration, bad thing for the people of Guam. So here we are now in a situation where Way too many people have been out of work for way too long and they're burning through their financial resources. And pretty soon they're gonna, a lot of people are gonna be in serious trouble. And as you drive around the island, see all the people panhandling on street corners in places that we never used to have panhandlers before. We know that the lot of people have hit rock bottom and are getting desperate. So on top of that, we have, uh, on top of our collapsed economy because of tourism troubles, we're not going to see that economy come back probably for years, maybe 2025, 2026, if we're lucky for it to come back and hit the same levels it had in 2018, 2019. But with the situation in the Ukraine, I think that that is going to be stalled even further. We have inflation pressures that are hitting our island big time. I just went to the grocery store yesterday and I am really, really frustrated because as a senior citizen living on a fixed income, I plan my budgets very carefully and I'm not able to buy nearly as much stuff to feed my family as I was a year ago, six months ago. 
So the inflation pressures are here now. And the cost of living is skyrocketing. I mean, we, we see that you know, in the news every day. We feel it every day in our pocketbooks as we uh, uh, continue to see the price of gas spiraling up, the price of everything in the stores spiraling up. Uh, and also, as we see now, the price of utilities is going to be spiraling up. So the pressure is coming down on the people of Guam and it's coming down a lot harder. And in fact, the inflationary pressures are so strong that even the federal government has uh, raised their cost of living for federal employees on Guam by 12.45%. So even the federal government is acknowledging that the inflation rate here on Guam is going up at double digit rates. We see it in the housing cost, we see it in the food cost, we see it in the price, in the price of uh, commodities and things in the store, and we see it in housing. And coming soon, we're gonna see it even more in utilities. Which brings me to today's team. It's a new season, proclaim Camacho Ada as they launch their gubernatorial bid. A new season for what? That's what my question is. First of all, it should not come as a surprise to anybody here that I have my uh, doubts about this team. Um, I've been watching politics very closely since I came back here in 2007 and have been engaged in politics since 2007. So I've gotten to see a lot of these people in action over a long period of time. And this team does not, does not inspire me. I had hopes that if Camacho ran again and picked the right lieutenant governor, I could have had confidence, but instead he picked the wrong lieutenant governor. And I'll tell you why. When you look at this picture right here, it says it all. This picture right here shows that this is not a united Republican Party. It is still as divided as it ever was. In fact, there's Eddie Calvo sitting there in his chair sulking saying, it could have been me. It should have been me. After all, you know, I put a lot of time and effort and money into uh, getting into office, and it should have been me. But what he also acknowledges is that because of his time in office and his uh, relentless harvesting of public assets for private wealth, you know, Guam YTK, Guam Lejeune Landfill, just to name a few. He knew that he couldn't make it in. So that's why he uh, is trying. But here's the problem I have with this. Because when I look at this team right here, you know, this picture says it all to me. Because when I look at this picture, this is the reality. Oops. <laughs> Lost control. Here we go. This picture right here says it all to me. Because this is the reality we are dealing with. Calmacho Ada 2022. I mean, look at the face of Governor Calvo in this picture compared to the earlier picture. He looks like he's in the catbird seat. So I have to wonder what deal did he and Felix come to that uh, gave him the ability to su support Felix Camacho in a bid for governor. And the reason why I believe we're looking at Camacho at a because this governor, Felix Camacho, um, 
basically is fronting for this team right here. And that's why, as Republicans, I'm concerned. As a Republican, I'm very concerned because this, this just further trashes the Republican Party of Guam. I mean, the Republican Party is supposed to stand for, you know, conservative government, low-cost government, small taxes, strong law enforcement. This ain't the team that's going to do it. No way, shape, or form. And the reason why I'm concerned about the, uh, the appearance of what I call the Calmacho Atta team is because even though Felix claims to be running for governor, we heard his speech and his, his passion wasn't there. His heart wasn't in it. It was almost like he was going through the motions to... Uh, provide cover for, for Eddie Calvo to run for office. And the reason I say that is because one of the biggest challenges I had was Tony Atta. And the reason why is this. <coughs> this is a story about a confirmation hearing and in this story about the confirmation hearing, Chris Duenas is talking about waste to energy. And then uh, we have uh, Tony Atta talking about how he hears everybody talking about waste energy. I, I don't hear anybody talking about waste energy except for uh, Tony Atta and Chris Duenas because they were part of the team. This is Team GRRP, Team Waste to Energy. And the reason why this team keeps fighting for waste to energy is because there's a lot of money behind this project. And even though it could, this was the sacred cow of the Calvo Tenorio administration. Yeah, Guam YTK, you know, 12 million here. Three million in attorney's fees. Yeah, that was all well and good. But this is the real cash cow right here. Because even though this company does not exist, it doesn't have a Guam charter. It was a partnership company, but the partner dissolved the corporation back in 2010. They don't have a business license. They don't even have officers. And the front man for the organization has passed away. They still keep trying to get this passed. And that's why, if this project had gone through on the deal that Calvo had signed just weeks into his second term, the taxpayers of Guam would have been on the hook for $81 million by the first day of operation. And by the end of the first year, government of Guam would have been short $75 million. But this team doesn't care because they're only in it for the money. George Sadiyama said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's a good warning that we should have. And uh, the reason I say that is because, remember this, the pay raise debacle? Yeah. That was where, under the Calvo Tenorio administration, they called a special session. Now, bear in mind, you know, it was called in special session. Without public notice, they introduced and passed a massive retroactive pay raise. And even though uh, Ray Tenorio was lieutenant governor who called the special session, I don't believe for a second that he woke up one morning while Governor Calvo was off island and said, hey, I'm going to call a special session and give uh, ourselves a dramatic uh, pay raise. I don't think, I don't think uh, Governor, I don't think Ray Tenorio did that. I think he did it with the full knowledge of Governor Calvo. And I have been fighting this administration, the Calvo administration, over this issue, which is basically what I consider corruption in politics. Anytime pay, 
policymakers give themselves a massive retroactive pay raise in secret, that's corruption as far as I'm concerned. And that led to me forming and actively campaigning against the Gang of Eight in 2016. And we were successful at knocking out six of the eight only to have them all come back in the Calvo Tenorio administration backing GRRP. And that's why with uh, Eddie Calvo still pursuing waste energy and with Chris Duenas championing it and bringing it up in the legislature and Tony Ada as the lieutenant governor, that's why I look at this as the uh, Camacho Ada team. Now the Camacho Ada team has a lot to live down. Hold on, let me catch up with you guys here. Now, the Camacho Ada team has a lot to live down because remember, under the Calvo administration, there were a lot of issues that uh, took place, you know, in uh, uh, housing, uh, Lejeune Landfill, where they went in and uh, held themselves to 31, 34 million additional taxpayer dollars, the attempted hijacking of uh, Simon Sanchez school contract, and of course, really, I mean, this went on into the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration, where Roy Respicio got appointed to the uh, commercial port and within days of his arrival he tried to settle uh, tried a secret settlement with Guam YTK for something like seven five to seven million dollars it was later thrown out in court but we didn't get any help whatsoever from Governor Calvo during this whole time he just hands off you know so that is why I am not comfortable with uh, sending the uh, the, the uh, Calmacho team into office. Because with Eddie as the power behind the throne, no telling how many other public assets are going to be at risk at a time when government of Guam is struggling financially. We know that the federal large S is going to come to an end very soon. And I do not trust this team to be able to handle it. Uh, I, I would have had a lot more confidence if this had been the team. <laughs> that would have been good. You know, with uh, Mary Torres as the moral compass, I think that I would have been comfortable with Felix as governor, with Mary Torres as lieutenant governor or with uh, Juan Benitez as uh, lieutenant governor. I would have been comfortable with either one of those, but I am not comfortable with this combination. And that's why it is so important that we pass these initiatives, this election that's going to be coming up. Working on the paperwork now, and as soon as I get the paperwork completed, we'll go to the next step, which will be uh, okay. Hold on here. There we go. We'll go to the next step, which will be uh, signature gathering, because we need to collect about 3,500 valid signatures. So we're going to try for five to make sure we get everybody on board with valid signatures. Because when we pass these initiatives, eliminate the primary election, which is the biggest barrier for new faces to run for the legislature. And we go to a part-time legislature, which will enable the best and brightest among us to do their public service without having to sacrifice their careers or their businesses. And return to 21 senators, because right now with 15 senators, we've concentrated too much power in too few hands. And then we need to install a Corrupt Practices Act. This will allow citizens to hold government agencies and individuals accountable for violating the law 
violating policies, established policy procedures and rules in such a manner that causes expense to the taxpayer or harm to the public. Right now, we don't have that. I mean, how else can you explain millions of dollars in paid payroll awards, lawsuit awards through the civil service over blubbed, flubbed, screwed up uh, firings? But nobody pays the penalty for that other than the taxpayers. I think they're up to about $5 million right now, somewhere between 3 and $5 million in awards, damages for uh, improper conduct, improper activity. That's 3 to $5 million that didn't go to fighting the drug war by buying drug dogs. And as we've seen every day, every day we're seeing in the news someone being arrested for uh, at a traffic stop with drugs. They're that plentiful. We just saw in the paper today that about three pounds of meth have been confiscated in the post office. So that's why we need to pass the Corrupt Practices Act and more importantly elect a public prosecutor. Because the Attorney General basically represents the Attorney General of Guam. That's why we got this aggressive catch and release program and there's uh, story after story about uh, people on pre-trial release being arrested multiple times for other crimes. That has to end. And the only way that ends is we get a public prosecutor elected who's concerned about protecting the voters, not concerned about protecting government of Guam. And we need to empower our public auditor. We need to give the public auditor the ability to file legal actions on his own without having to turn them over to the uh, attorney general's office after he does his research work. Then and only then will we have a government of people, by people, for people. But the way the cr current system works right now, it's a, po it's a government of politicians, by politicians, for politicians. And that does not serve the public interest in any way, shape, or form. I'm Ken Leon Guerrero. I'm a community advocate. And this is my point of view, and I hope in time to help you learn enough to make wise decisions about who to vote for in this upcoming election. Because you need to vote as if the future of your children and your grandchildren depend on it. Because it does.